This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 90. Coming up on Space Time, more clues about our recent interstellar visitor, why the star Regulus is almost ripping itself apart, and another gravity wave discovery from merging black holes. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have released new details about that mysterious interstellar visitor who sped through our solar system during September and October. First noticed on October the 19th by astronomers at the University of Hawaii, the new data shows the object, now known as 1I 2017U1, measures some 180 by 30 metres and is shaped a little like a fat cigar, about half a city block long. Since its discovery, astronomers who've had access to telescope time have been zooming in on the object to see exactly what they can learn. 1I 2017U1 dropped into our solar system from the direction of the constellation Lyra after cruising through interstellar space at around 25.5 kilometres per second. It approached our solar system from almost directly above the ecliptic, the orbital plane upon which the planets and most asteroids orbit the Sun. This trajectory means it didn't have any close encounters with the eight major planets during its plunge towards the Sun. By backtracking its course, scientists now realise that on September the 2nd, it crossed just under the ecliptic, just inside Mercury's orbit, then made perihelion its closest approach to the Sun on September the 9th. Pulled by the Sun's gravity, the object made a hairpin turn under our solar system, passing underneath the Earth on October the 14th at a distance of about 24 million kilometres, some 60 times the distance of the Moon. Its trajectory and speed means it's on its way out of our solar system and won't be coming back. It's now shot back up above the ecliptic as it speeds towards the constellation Pegasus. The strange visitor, be it asteroid or comet, zipping through our solar system at high speed has given astronomers a once-in-a-generation opportunity to examine up close and personal an object from somewhere else in our galaxy. Ralph Catula from the University of Wisconsin-Madison describes the interstellar visitor as a really rare object. Catula and colleagues use the National Optical Astronomy Observatory's 3.5-metre wind telescope on Kitt Peak, Arizona, to take some of the first images of the interstellar interloper. According to Catula's latest readings, the object's now speeding through the solar system at an astonishing 64,374 kilometres per hour. The extreme high rate of speed in orbit confirms that 1I 2017U1 didn't originate from within the solar system, or for that matter, from the surrounding Oort cloud of tag-along objects travelling with our solar system around the galaxy. Catula says the object's considerable speed is proof that it's not bound to the Sun like the comets and asteroids native to our solar system. The wind telescope observations were made on October the 27th, shortly after the object's closest pass to the Earth. Reporting on the pre-press physics website archive.org, Catula and colleagues say that aside from its origin beyond the solar system, its unusual orbit and shape, and its high rate of speed, this object is unremarkable in its physical properties compared to similar objects from within our solar system. Because it's so small and moving at such a high rate of speed, the object, even to a relatively large telescope like Wynn, appears like nothing more than a faint small fuzzy spot on the background of stars. The combination of being both faint and fast means that 1I2017U1 is unlikely to be observed by many amateur astronomers, that brigade of dedicated sky watchers that typically identifies new comets or asteroids sweeping close to Earth. Interestingly, the wind observations didn't detect a coma, that nebulous envelope of gas and dust created when comets heat up as they pass near the Sun. Nor did the observations show that signature feature of a cometary-like tail. Catula says the absence of a fuzzy halo or a detectable comet tail doesn't mean it's not a comet. But he says as to what it still is, that's a question yet to be answered. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study of the star Regulus has confirmed that it's almost spinning fast enough to quite literally rip itself apart. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, show that the star has a spin rate of 96.5% of the angular velocity needed to break apart. 
The research has provided unprecedented insights into the star, allowing scientists to determine its rate of spinning and the orientation in space of the star's spin axis. The study's lead author, Dr Daniel Carton from the University of New South Wales, says Regulus is rotating at approximately 320 kilometres per second, the equivalent of travelling from Sydney to Canberra in less than a second or New York City to Washington DC in just over a second. Regulus is located 79 light years away in the constellation Leo the Lion. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky with about 3.5 times the mass of the Sun. Regulus is actually a multiple star system consisting of at least four stars. Regulus A is a binary star consisting of a blue-white spectral type B main sequence star which is highly ellipsoidal or oblate in shape due to its extreme rotational period of just 15.9 hours. This results in gravity darkening, in which the star's photosphere at the poles is both considerably hotter and some five times brighter per unit surface area than its equatorial region. That's because its oblate shape means its poles are closer to the star's centre while its equator is further away. It's orbited every 40 Earth days by a small binary companion thought to be a white dwarf of about 0.3 solar masses. Judging by its temperature, luminosity and mass, Regulus A was thought to be a fairly young star, only about 50 to 100 million years old. However, the discovery of its white dwarf companion would mean the system's got to be at least a billion years old to account for the formation of the white dwarf. The discrepancy can be accounted for by a history of mass transfer onto what was once a smaller Regulus A. Located further away are Regulus B, C and D, which are all dim main sequence stars. Regulus B and C are located about 5,000 astronomical units from Regulus A, an astronomical unit being the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. Regulus B and C share a common proper motion through space and so are thought to be orbiting each other every 600 Earth years. Regulus B is a spectral type K orange dwarf main sequence star, slightly smaller and cooler than the Sun. Regulus C is even smaller and cooler. It's a main sequence spectral type M red dwarf star. As for Regulus D, it appears to be a 12th magnitude companion star which shares a common motion in space with the other stars. The Regulus study also provides the first observational proof of Indian astrophysicist and Nobel laureate Chandrasekhar's 1946 prediction that rapidly rotating stars would emit polarised light. To make their discovery, scientists designed and built HIPPI, the High Precision Polarimetric Instrument, which they then attached to the Anglo-Australian Telescope at the Siding Spring Observatory in country New South Wales, west of Sydney. HIPPI is the world's most sensitive astronomical polarimeter, specifically designed to detect polarised light being emitted from rapidly spinning stars. Chandrasekhar's 1946 prediction of emissions of polarised light coming from the edges of stars prompted development of sensitive instruments called stellar polarimeters to try and detect this effect. Optical polarisation is the measure of the orientation of the oscillations of a beam of light in its direction of travel. In 1968, other researchers built on Chandrasekhar's work to predict that the distorted or squashed shape of a rapidly rotating star would lead to the emission of polarised light. But its detection has always eluded astronomers, at least until now. Cotton and colleagues were able to combine their new information about Regulus with sophisticated computer models developed by the University of New South Wales to determine the star's inclination and rotational rate. It had previously been extremely difficult to measure these properties in rapidly rotating stars. Cotton says the information is crucial for understanding the life cycles of most of the hottest and largest stars in the universe which are also the ones producing the heaviest elements in interstellar space, such as iron and nickel. It was a result in a polarimetric survey, actually, that led us to look more closely at Regulus. It had a slightly higher polarisation than many of the other stars around it in the interstellar medium. And at that time, it had been hypothesised that a rapidly spinning star could produce a higher polarisation. But nobody had seen that effect and with any certainty whatsoever. So to confirm that, what we had to do was we had to look at Regulus in different wavelength bands. So we had to look at it in different colours to see if it really did exhibit that effect. Tell our listeners what you mean by polarisation. How does light get polarised? OK, so if you think about a, a star, the light that comes to us from the edges of the star is scattered at an angle of uh, close to 50 degrees. So most uh, light is unpolarised, but the larger the scattering angle, the higher the polarisation. So you'll see this, for example, if you look at the ocean and you see glare off the ocean, the glare is light that's been scattered off the ocean.
radiation and the closer that scattering angle is to 50 degrees the more glare you'll see and the more highly polarized it'll be and that's why people wear polarized sunglasses i've got to keep taking them off when i'm catching a train home because all the plasma screens are polarized in such a way that i've got to tilt my head sideways to work out where my train is yeah that's exactly right in polarized sunglasses you've got these long chain polymers that are all aligned with each other and what that does is that allows light that is polarized in the opposite direction so a wave 90 degrees to the polymers to pass through whereas the ones that are aligned with the polymers are absorbed and don't get through how does that help us with looking at polarized light from regulus okay so instead of the polaroid filter you have in your sunglasses in the instrument that we have we have a thing called a wallaston prism and it sort of splits the two different polarization signals one at zero degrees and one at 90 degrees and sends them to two different detectors the reason we've been able to get much higher precision with our polarimeter than people have been able to before is because we modulate that signal so we swap the signal from orientated in zero degrees to 90 degrees and back again really really quickly so we do that at a speed of 500 hertz and that's fast enough that we can beat the noise you get from the atmosphere being turbulent. And that lets you look at Regulus. I take it this is regular, the primary in Regulus A you were looking at? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a secondary star, which might be a white dwarf or might be a, a later a main sequence star. But because Regulus A is so much brighter, then the other star doesn't have very much effect on our measurements at all. Yeah, I think it's about, what, three and a half times the mass of the sun and uh, probably a blue star. Yeah, so it's um, what they call a, a B7 type star. It's blue, it's uh, radiant at the poles is about 3.2 times that of the sun. And I guess this is where you start looking at the other properties of the star as well, because one of the things about Regulus is that there's always been suspicion that it's rotating very fast. Yeah, so there's been a previous measurement using technique of interferometry where they use a number of telescopes in an array to try and get a sort of a pseudo image of the object. And our measurement is more precise in terms of the spin speed of Regulus, but there's a little bit better in terms of the inclination. One of the reasons we were so certain that we had the first detection of this type of phenomenon is because our measurements agreed so well with interferometry. The thing is, though, that they've only been able to look at, say, half a dozen stars with the interferometry technique because you have to have a star that is both big, spinning fast, and close enough to be able to resolve it. And because fast rotating stars are so important, the amount of heavy element in interstellar space, we really need a lot more measurements of these types of stars to understand those processes. So this teaches us something about uh, stellar evolution then? Yes. There's this thing called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is basically how bright a star is versus its colour. And most stars move along a particular line called the main sequence, and then when they've used up all their fuel, they turn off and uh, become giants and then eventually die in various different ways depending on their mass. And this diagram has been interpreted uh, in terms of the mass of stars for a long time. But it turns out rotation is important as well. And if you don't take rotation into account, then you get a false idea of exactly what the life cycle is for certain stars. And the heaviest stars are mostly rotating very, very quickly. So without information on rotation, our idea of the heaviest stars, which produce the heaviest elements, which then go back into form molecular clouds and new star systems and planets that formed out of them, if we don't have that information, then we don't know you know, what's available to create the next um, set of stars and planets, or indeed what was available exactly in the past. It's how we find out the metallicity of the universe around us and more distant. Yes, so metallicity is an important factor in stars. We think it might be important in planet formation. The jury's still out on, on that. But you can look at the spectra of a star and look at specific absorption lines to try and work out metallicity, but it's a bit more difficult with the interstellar medium. When you looked at Regulus, what did you see? What did you find? Okay, so we found it was uh, spinning at 96.5% of its critical velocity for breakup. That means that it's spinning fast enough that at the equatorial regions, we're at 96.5% of the speed you would need before the gravity was effectively zero there and the gas would float away. And we found that it was pretty well inclined close to equator on, so its inclination was greater than 76 and a half degrees. And from Why that, is that we're important? Able to get, well, from that, we're able to get both the temperature and uh, the gravity of the star. And we can map those over the surface using gravity darkening laws and with that information that's critical to understanding the stellar evolution process. Now earlier we talked about the dimensions of uh, Regulus and uh, you, you mentioned its polar diameter but I take it if it's spinning that fast its equatorial diameter will be somewhat different. Yeah so it's squashed in sort of an oblate spheroid just like the earth is but its equatorial radius is 4.2 times that of 
the sun, whereas the polar uh, one was only 3.2, so it squashed a fair bit. That's Dr Daniel Cotton from the University of New South Wales. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Scientists have confirmed another detection of gravitational waves generated by the collision of two stellar mass black holes. A report in the Astrophysical Journal Letters and on the pre-press physics website archive.org claims this latest detection involves the merger of two relatively lightweight black holes with just 7 and 12 times the mass of our Sun respectively. The merger took place about a billion light years away. The event, named GW170608, resulted in the creation of a new black hole with some 18 times the mass of the Sun, meaning that an amount of energy equivalent to the mass of our Sun was emitted into space as gravitational waves during the collision. Gravitational waves are ripples in the very fabric of space-time, caused by collisions between massive objects, such as colliding neutron stars or black holes. You can think of gravitational waves as being a bit like three-dimensional versions of ripples made by throwing a pebble into a still pond, only far smaller, causing space-time to alternatively stretch and contract by less than the diameter of a proton. GW170608 is the lightest black hole binary that LIGO has so far observed, and so it's one of the first cases of black holes detected through gravitational waves having masses similar to black holes detected indirectly through electromagnetic radiation such as X-rays. This discovery, therefore, will enable astronomers to compare the properties of black holes gleaned from gravitational wave observatories with those of similar mass black holes previously only detected through X-ray studies, and so it fills a missing link between the two classes of black hole observatories. The detection was made by the LIGO collaboration on June the 8th. It was actually the second binary black hole merger to be observed during LIGO's second observational run since its upgrade through a program called Advanced LIGO. However, its announcement was delayed due to the time needed to understand the other two LIGO discoveries, a LIGO-Virgo 3-detector observation of gravitational waves from another black hole binary merger, GW170814, on August the 14th, and the first ever detection of a binary neutron star merger, GW870817, in both light and gravitational waves on August the 17th. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. The facility actually comprises two observatories, one in Livingston, Louisiana, the other in Hanford, Washington State. Each observatory comprises two four-kilometer long perpendicular tunnels. A laser beam is fired into a splitter, which then generates two beams, one fired down each of the tunnels to reflectors at the far end. The beams are then reflected back to a detector, which checks for an interference pattern in the return signal caused by a passing gravitational wave. The fact that LIGO was able to detect GW170608 also involved a fair bit of luck. You see, for a month before the detection, LIGO had paused its second observational run to open the vacuum systems on both facilities for maintenance work. Researchers at LIGO Livingston completed their maintenance and were able to observe again after about two weeks. However, LIGO Hanford encountered additional problems which delayed its return to observing. On the afternoon of June 7, LIGO Hanford was finally able to stay online reliably, and staff were making final preparations to once again listen for incoming gravitational waves. As part of these preparations, the team at Hanford were making routine adjustments to reduce the level of noise in the gravitational wave data caused by angular motion of the main mirrors. To disentangle how much of this angular motion affected the data, scientists shook the mirrors ever so slightly, but at very specific frequencies. It was just a few minutes into this procedure that GW170608 passed through Hanford's interferometer, reaching Louisiana about 7 milliseconds later. LIGO Livingston quickly reported the possible detection. But since Hanford's detector was being worked on at the time, its automatic detection system wasn't engaged. 
While the procedure being performed affected LIGO Hanford's ability to automatically analyse the incoming data, it didn't prevent the observatory from actually detecting the gravitational waves. Because the procedure only affected a narrow frequency range, LIGO Hanford researchers, having learned of the detection in Louisiana, were still able to look for and find the waves in the data after excluding those frequencies. For this detection, the European Virgo detector near Pisa in Italy was still in a commissioning phase. It didn't start taking data until August the 1st. Both the LIGO and Virgo detectors are currently offline for further upgrades to improve sensitivity. And in the near future, they'll be joined by several more detectors, including one in Japan and one in India. The Indian one's significant because it was originally offered to Australia, but turned down by the then Gillard Labor government. Scientists expect to launch their new observing run with both LIGO and Virgo in the second half of 2018, though there will be occasional test runs during which more detections may well occur. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A new study of Pluto's atmosphere may explain why the dwarf planet at the outer rim of the solar system is so much colder than expected. The gas composition of a planet's atmosphere generally determines how much heat gets trapped within that atmosphere. For Pluto, however, the predicted temperature based on the composition of its atmosphere was far higher than the actual measurements taken by NASA's New Horizons spacecraft during its historic flyby of the frozen world in July 2015. The new study, reported in the journal Nature, indicates a novel cooling mechanism controlled by haze particles could account for Pluto's frigid atmosphere. According to this new hypothesis, the cooling mechanism on Pluto involves the absorption of heat by atmospheric haze particles. These particles then emit infrared radiation, cooling the atmosphere by radiating the energy out into space. The results an atmospheric temperature of about 70 Kelvin or minus 203 degrees Celsius instead of the predicted temperature of 100 Kelvin or minus 173 degrees Celsius. Extensive layers of atmospheric haze can be seen in images of Pluto taken by New Horizons. The haze results from chemical interactions in the upper atmosphere, where ultraviolet radiation from the distant sun ionizes nitrogen and methane, which react to form tiny hydrocarbon particles tens of nanometers in diameter. As these tiny particles sink down through the atmosphere, they stick together to form aggregates that grow larger as they descend, eventually settling onto the surface. These hydrocarbon particles are related to the reddish and brownish material seen in many images of Pluto's surface. The study's lead author, Assistant Professor Zhai Zhang from the University of California, Santa Cruz, says Pluto is the first planetary body known where the atmospheric energy budget is dominated by solid phase haze particles instead of by gas. The findings may help solve the mystery which first started when astronomers received their first temperature data from New Horizons. The excess infrared radiation from these haze particles in Pluto's atmosphere should be detectable by the James Webb Space Telescope allowing possible confirmation of the new hypothesis following the telescope's launch. Researchers say they're interested in studying the effects of haze particles in the atmospheric energy budget of other planetary bodies as well, such as Neptune's moon Triton and Saturn's moon Titan. Their findings would also be relevant to future investigations of exoplanets with hazy atmospheres. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists have ruled out two nearby pulsars as the possible sources for a mysterious excess of antimatter particles found near Earth. Back in 2008, astronomers observed an unexpectedly high number of positrons, the antimatter counterparts of electrons, in orbit just a few hundred kilometres above the planet. Ever since then, scientists have been debating the possible cause of the anomaly, and they've now narrowed the arguments down to two competing hypotheses to try and explain the origins of this additional antimatter. Some suggest these extra antimatter particles might be originating from nearby rapidly spinning neutron stars called pulsars. Neutron stars are the collapsed stellar cores of stars far more massive than the Sun, which have exploded as supernovae at the ends of their lives. Spinning at many times a second, pulsars throw off electrons, positrons and other matter with violent force as they rotate. The other hypothesis involves dark matter processes. 
Dark matter is an invisible but pervasive substance which makes up some 80% of all the matter in the universe, but can only be seen through its gravitational influence on normal matter. To try and resolve the issue, astronomers used a remote high-energy observatory in Mexico to capture the first wide-angle view of gamma rays being emitted by the pulsars. The high-altitude water Cherenkov Gamma Ray Observatory provided a fresh perspective on the high-energy light streaming from these stellar neighbours, in the process casting serious doubt on the pulsar explanation. You see, by catching and counting particles of light streaming from these nearby stellar engines, scientists found that the two pulsars are unlikely to be the origin of the positron excess. The findings, reported in the journal Science, found that despite being the right age and the right distance from Earth, the pulsars are surrounded by an extended murky cloud, preventing most positrons from escaping. The study's lead author, Professor Jordan Goodman from the University of Maryland, says the new measurements are tantalising because they strongly disfavour the idea of the extra positrons coming from two nearby pulsars. The measurement doesn't decide the question in favour of dark matter, but any new theory that attempts to explain the excess using pulsars will need to account for what's been found. As with any old ordinary camera, collecting lots of light allows the high-altitude water Cherenkov Observatory to build up sharp images of individual gamma ray sources. The most energetic gamma rays originate in the graveyards of big stars, around stellar remains like the spinning pulsar remnants of supernovae. But that light doesn't come from the stars themselves. Instead, it's created when the spinning pulsar accelerates particles to extremely high energies, causing them to smash into lower energy photons left over from the early universe. The size of the debris fields around powerful pulsars, measured by the patch of sky that glows bright in gamma rays, tells researchers how quickly matter moves relative to the spinning stars. This enables researchers to estimate how quickly positrons are moving, and how many positrons could have reached the Earth from a given source. Even though the two target pulsars, Jaminga and pulsar PSR B0656 plus 14, are both old enough and close enough to account for the excess, high-energy positrons simply aren't streaming out from the pulsars fast enough to have reached the Earth. The high-altitude water Cherenkov Gamma Ray Observatory sits at an elevation of 13,500 feet, flanking the Sierra Negra volcano in Mexico. The observatory is made up of more than 300 massive water tanks. Think of each water tank as being a pixel. The water tanks sit there waiting for cascades of high-energy gamma rays to hit Earth's upper atmosphere, many of which have more than 10 million times the energy of an average dental X-ray. When these gamma rays smash into the upper atmosphere, they blast apart atoms in the air, producing a shower of particles moving at nearly the speed of light towards the ground. When this shower of particles reaches the tanks of the observatory, it produces coordinated flashes of blue light in the water known as Cherenkov radiation. The Cherenkov radiation is then picked up by photoreceptors, which allows researchers to reconstruct the energy and cosmic origin of the gamma rays that kicked off the cascade. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Individuals with autism spectrum disorder often find it really difficult to look directly into the faces of other people. This avoidance has typically been interpreted by neurotypicals as being a sign of social or personal indifference. But those suffering from autism know that's simply not true. People on the autism spectrum find it uncomfortable, embarrassing, even difficult and painful to look directly at other people. And that points to a neurological cause. Now, a study published in the journal Nature Scientific Reports has discovered that this behaviour is a way of decreasing an unpleasant overactivation in part of the brain. The key to this research lies in the brain's subcortical system, which is responsible for the natural orientation towards faces seen in newborns and is important later in life for emotion perception. The subcortical system can be specifically activated by eye contact. And previous research already found that among those with autism, it's oversensitive to the effects imposed by direct gaze and emotional expression. The new research follows on by finding out what happens when people with autism are forced to look into the eyes of faces conveying different emotions. Using functional magnetic resonance imaging, scientists measured differences in activation within the face processing component of the subcortical system in people both with autism and a non-autistic control group. While activation of these structures was similar for both groups exhibited during free viewing, overactivation was observed in those with autism when concentrating on the eye region. 
The findings of the study support the hypothesis of an imbalance between the brain's excitatory and inhibitory signaling networks in autism. Excitatory refers to neurotransmitters that stimulate the brain, while inhibitory refers to those that calm it down and provide equilibrium. A new study claims salty diets may raise blood pressure by killing off specific gut bacteria. A report in the journal Nature found that a high-salt diet reduced lactobacillus bacteria and increased the production of immune cells linked to high blood pressure. Researchers found that when replenished with the lost bacteria, the effects were reversed. The next step would involve medical trials to determine whether probiotics might prevent or treat salt-related conditions such as high blood pressure. A new study has confirmed what some people have already noticed. Those who tend to smoke or drink excessively really do look older than non-smokers and moderate drinkers. The findings reported in the journal Epidemiology and Community Health add to the growing list of reasons why booze and smokes are really bad for your body. Researchers looked at over 11,500 people over an average of 11 and a half years and noticed any signs of ageing that had previously been linked to heightened risks of bad heart health or death. The signs they looked for were earlobe increases, grey rings in the eyes, plaques on eyelids and baldness. While they can't prove the cause and effect, the authors found that heavy drinking and smoking were linked to the signs. And thankfully there was no similar correlation to signs of ageing for those who are only moderate or light drinkers. Paleontologists have concluded that the world's largest known dinosaur tracks were made some 150 million years ago by a seropod dinosaur at least 35 metres long weighing between 35 and 40 tonnes. The tracks were discovered back in 2009 near a village in the French Jarrah Mountains. Since then, a series of excavations at the site have uncovered other tracks sprawling over a total distance of more than 150 metres. They form the longest seropod trackway ever found. Seropods are those herbivorous dinosaurs that look a lot like the Flintstones pet Dino. They have elephant-like bodies and legs, with a very long neck and small head at one end and an equally long tail at the other. The findings reported in the journal GeoBios includes dating of the limestone layers showing the trackway was formed 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period. At that time, the site lay on a vast carbonate platform bathed in a warm, shallow sea. The presence of large dinosaurs indicates the region must have been studded with many islands offering enough vegetation to sustain the large animal population. Land bridges emerged when the sea levels lowered, connecting the islands and allowing the giants to migrate. Additional excavations in 2015 enabled a closer study of the tracks. Scientists worked out the size of the seropods by looking at the tracks themselves. Those left by seropods' feet span between 94 and 103 centimetres, and the total length of each stride is up to 3 metres. The hind footprints reveal five elliptical toe marks, while the foreprints, or handprints if you prefer, are characterised by five circular finger marks arranged in an arc. Biometric analysis suggests the dinosaurs had an average stride of 2.8 metres and strolled at a speed of about 4 kilometres per hour. And it seems the seropods weren't alone. Other trackways at the same site indicate the presence of a carnivorous dinosaur, Megalosaurpus. And finally for now, archaeological evidence unearthed in Tuscany has dated the birth of modern winemaking techniques in Europe to around 200 BCE. The findings reported in the journal PLOS One are based on the discovery of a sudden jump in the size of grape pips, indicating a bigger fruit. This occurred at about the same time as the Romans took over from the Etruscans. Archaeologists say the evidence shows that Romans appeared to build on primitive Etruscan viticulture, introducing techniques learnt from the Greek and Phoenician wine cultures, such as planting in rows and prunings. And it was these Roman improvements which soon spread throughout Europe. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's 
Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 